Today, we're in Cairo, Egypt, on the banks of the ancient, ever-beautiful Nile River. By we, I mean Grady Wilson, Walter Smith, and Roy Gustafson. Cairo is different than when I last visited here. It is filled with bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and it seems that everyone uses his horn. Cairo is now one of the largest cities in the world with nearly 10 million population. The people have a new confidence in themselves and their destiny. They love their leader, President Sadat, and there's a new friendliness toward Americans. You can sense it and feel it everywhere. We've been invited to hold an evangelistic effort here, or a conference here sometime in the next two years by Christian leaders of the country. Most Americans are surprised to learn that there are hundreds of Christian churches in Egypt. Over 10% of the population is Christian. There are scores of prayer groups and Bible study groups here that are praying for spiritual awakening. Rarely have I seen such dedication to Christ on the part of Christians anywhere in the world. The Christians feel the need of revival, and they also have a great desire to witness to non-believers as to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Egypt has a continuous recorded history of 5,000 years. That's hard to believe standing here, the longest of any nation in the world. You believe it when you look out from your hotel window and see the pyramids that have been there for so long that no one really knows when they began. The country has alternated between periods of strength when neighboring territories were under its domination and periods of weakness when it came under foreign rule. Egypt was a united kingdom from about 3200 BC until Alexander the Great conquered it in 333 BC. From then until the 20th century, it was under almost continuous foreign domination. The last period of foreign rule began in 1882 when the British occupied Egypt and it became a British protectorate in 1914. Egypt gained its independence in 1922 as a monarchy, but with extensive British influence and power. The monarchy itself and the British presence were overthrown in 1953 and a republic was declared, which is still in effect today. Christianity in Egypt can trace its origin to the first century and was prominent until about the sixth century. The Christian community in Egypt today represents about 10% of the total population, and it is a community comprised of a wide variety of Christian denominations, the ancient Coptic church, the Presbyterian church, uh, many Plymouth Brethren assemblies, and many of the denominations that all of us are familiar with are here in Egypt. And Christians are free in Egypt to worship, and Cairo alone has more than 200 churches. Evangelicals are growing in numbers and in strength in Egypt, and there is a move among evangelicals today, as has not happened in this century, not only of unity, but of spiritual strength. As we were coming in to the airport, our plane had to circle for a long time because there was a dense fog over the airport. But as we circled out toward the Suez Canal, we could see that much of Egypt was a desert. And I was reminded that 99% of the people live on 4% of the land, which is largely along the Nile River. And I thought to myself about the desert in the Bible. I thought about what the Bible has to say about the desert. I remember the desert sends terrible winds blowing from the east, carrying clouds of dust and sand, sometimes across the sun. I remember one time when I was in Egypt as I was flying up from the Sudan, the sand was hitting the plain so hard that you could hear it like hail. The desert was the breeding ground of great nomadic tribes of the past. The desert was also the training ground of ancient Israel itself during the 40 terrible years when God was disciplining them as they were leaving Egypt to become a nation of their own. Those wilderness years that we're told in scriptures that we are to learn from in our own Christian experience left a mark forever on both Egypt and Israel. Out of the desert has come gr some of the greatest prophets of God, Elijah was a man of the desert. Amos was a man of the desert. Jeremiah was a man of the desert. And John the Baptist 
was also a man of the desert who was preparing the way for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there was the SN community of the Dead Sea Scrolls who gave their preachings about their ethics. And it was also the Lord Jesus Christ himself amid wild beasts and ministering angels who was to meet the devil in the desert or the wilderness as it was sometimes called. And it was against the constant background of this blistering, haggard wilderness that the people of God lived out their lives. It fascinated their imagination, influenced their culture, and haunted their literature, and colored even their theology. The souls of the people were strengthened as they were in the desert time after time, out under the stars. It was David that wrote some of the great psalms in the desert. This, in a deep spiritual sense, is still part of the human task. For we have to live our lives today with chaos as a possibility just over the horizon. We as a human race are now, in a sense, in a moral and spiritual desert. There are no wide, comfortable margins any longer between civilization and the edge of doom. On this trip, in which I have been on for nearly two months now, visiting leaders in various parts of the world, especially in the Far East, I have come to sense something of the tensions of the world, and you certainly sense it in the Middle East. Ever since Hiroshima, the world has felt the breath of the full force of the possibility of the extinction of the human race by atomic power. And every man has to meet this issue even in his own experience, because we too face problems and difficulties and trials in our own lives. For every pilgrim on the road to maturity in Christ has its bare, desolate tracks. Every gathering of believers could provide scores of personal stories of days of darkness and loneliness in a desert where life seems drained of meaning and strength and purpose, barren days of grief and heartache, broken hopes and paradise lost, each story ending with the words, that was my desert day. All the great masters of the spiritual life, like St. Augustine or Akempis or St. Teresa, warn us repeatedly that we must reckon for the day when helpers fail and comforts flee and God seems to withdraw his face and the wilderness clamps down upon our souls. The Christian has to come to terms with the desert. I remember when I was in Bible school many years ago, I had an experience like that. It seemed that the heavens were brass and my prayers would get nowhere. And I wrote to my mother about it, and I'll never forget the letter that she wrote in reply. She said, son, sometimes when you have a desert experience like this, and perhaps the fog is hanging low, and it's nothing but sand down below, remember to reach up by faith and you'll always find the hand of God there. And the Christian is called upon to walk by faith, not by feeling, not by sight. So many of us want experience. So many of us want feeling. So many of us want to sense something. God has told us that it's a walk of faith. As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive him? You received him by faith. How do you walk in Christ? You walk in faith. But all of us goes through this desert phenomena. God is always testing us. And there's one thing that is the cruelest of all when one is going through a desert experience, and that is the mirage. Far away, through the shimmering heat, the desert traveler would see a bright oasis full of palm trees telling of living water. And they would cry, thanks be unto God. And they would stumble in the direction of that vision or this vision. And they would thank God with every step that they took, only to find the vision receding, wavering, vanishing into nothing. And there on the bare rocks at last, he would lay himself down to die, mocked by that phantom called a mirage, and perhaps even hearing in his soul the echoes of a terrible mockery. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. But that is not God's voice. That voice is the voice of Satan himself because it is Satan that offers us mirages in the deserts of our lives and we are to test the spirits and see which is of God's spirit and which is of Satan's spirit, especially in these days when false prophets abound everywhere. 
Israel had such an experience. Egypt has had such experiences. Syria has had such experiences in their long history. Down through their history, God has spoken to them time after time. There's almost as much to say in the Bible about Egypt in prophecy as there is Israel in the Bible. And as I stand here, I think of all the passages in the Bible that God has spoken to Israel as well as to Egypt. Rarely have I looked over a great city as I look over Cairo. And since the past history of this city, the present developments, and the future as described in Scripture as I do here in Cairo on the Nile, when I saw and talked with President Sadat, I gave him a scroll with the words of Isaiah the prophet found in chapter 19, verses 24 and 25. And Isaiah the prophet says this, In that day, that is in that future day, shall Israel be the third party with Egypt and with Syria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt my people, and Syria the work of my hands, and Israel mine inheritance. In this passage, God is saying that in some future day when Christ returns, when Christ reigns, Egypt, Israel, and Syria will live together in peace and be a blessing to the whole world. This seems impossible now with the fighting in Lebanon and the mounting tensions that one feels in this part of the world. But someday, under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be a reality. That is not a mirage. That is a reality. The kingdom of God is coming. But in your personal life today, perhaps in the life that you live day by day, you're not so concerned about the great world problems. You're not so concerned about historical problems. You're concerned about your desert, your problems, the things that you have to go through. And sometimes the disillusionment is startling and crashing and overwhelming. Napoleon dreamed of world conquest and empire, and he ended up crying, great men are medias that consume themselves to light the earth. This is my burnt out hour. A goate in Vienna contemplated at 75 the heaped up prizes that the world had showered upon him, and he wrote this, my existence has been nothing but pain and burden, the perpetual rolling of a rock that must be raised up again forever. And remember Lord Byron, said these words, My days are in the yellow leaf, the flowers and fruits of love are gone, the worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. Yes, to many of you that are listening to my voice, all of life has its mirages, and you've fallen for those mirages, and they were false. I'm offering you the reality of the water, the pool that always refreshes. Jesus said, I am the water of life. He gives a water that not only refreshes, but it gives eternal life. And this is the water that the Lord Jesus Christ offers. You can't stay in Egypt long without realizing how important water is. I stood on the banks of Nile last night, and I watched this great river as it flowed down through the middle of Cairo. And I remembered that the people live along this river, and they depend upon this river for their livelihood. I remembered that far in the upper Egypt, is the great Aswan Dam. Some people say it's going to take many scores of years to fill that dam. But whatever the dam does or does not do for Egypt, one thing is certain, Egypt is going to be dependent upon this river as long as there's an Egypt for much of its water and for much of its life. And so you must depend upon the water of life that goes through the scriptures telling about the person of Jesus Christ who said himself, I am the water of life. Have you come to that water yourself in your own personal life? Do you know Christ as your Lord and as your Savior? Does he live in your heart? He can if you put your trust and your confidence in him. You say, but what do I have to do? Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Here in Egypt, there are thousands of true believers who have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I have met a few of them while I've been here on this brief trip. And I would appreciate your prayers for the Christians in Egypt today that God will sustain and bless them as there's an evidence that there's a spiritual awakening already beginning among them. Last summer in Brussels when we had our youth conference, more than 200 of our delegates came from Egypt, and we were impressed with the quality of their dedication to Christ. 
And as these people in Egypt have received Christ and followed him, so you can follow Jesus Christ in your own personal life by simply turning your life over to him. Because whether you live in New York or Miami or San Francisco, many of you are living in a desert. You can come to the water, the true water, and receive of it freely. And it's an everlasting water that leads to eternal life to give you joy, peace, and happiness such as you have never known. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank thee and praise thee for a gospel to proclaim at this hour that is water in the midst of a desert. And we pray today for Egypt. We pray for its leadership, that thou wouldst bless the people, especially the believers here. And we pray that thou wouldst bless the people of the whole world. And we pray that thou wouldst bring the Lord Jesus Christ back so that the world may know peace at last. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.